Welcome back, everyone, to Pontos Fathom Press. This is our Pontos Fathom podcast, episode number 61. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Saturn tradition, uh, Saturnine Gnosis. And we really want to focus on uh, the drifting name. Uh, this is kind of the Canian concept uh, in the uh, psychology of uh, Jacques Lacan, where he talks about the, the drifting subject. So the idea here is, you know, um, who you think the subject might be can shift over time. All right. So the, so so let's say, for example, um, you think you're playing a certain role and then you find out you're playing a different role. Right. So like, yeah, think of it like in, in a story where you see a character gets revealed to have inner motivations or secret motivations. Right. Well, Saturn is the Saturn tradition is something like this. You know, we've we've known, uh, we've got the uh, cult of the black cube, a Saturn on grimoire on the table here. We've got the Liz Green's Saturn, and a stack of other books. We're going to kind of go through this, but even Liz Green's a second title is a new look at an old devil for Saturn. You know, so so think of Saturn um, in the, in this tradition of you start out with this medieval notion of Saturn as the malefic planet, and now we see it more as a planet of discipline, as a planet of uh, kind of like a karmic planet, right? So there's a difference between born under a bad sign and processing karma. Right? And, and, and as a little illustration into the interconnectedness of names, I'm going to start out with Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars, just as this illustration. So, you know, you go into John Carter of Mars, and one of the things as a kid, I loved these when I was a kid, and, you know, so John Carter goes from the Arizona desert he goes up to Mars and he finds that all of the planets have different names. You know, so so on Earth we call Mars uh, Mars, but the Martians actually call Mars Barsoom. And they actually have names for all the planets. Like I think Earth was like Jansoom and there's Barsoom and all of these names of different planets. So when you're Reading this, you know, Burroughs fantasy sci-fi thing from the, you know, early 1900s, you're, when you're reading this, you you get introduced to this idea of, oh, they call it by another name. Okay, they call it by another name. But now this other name thing kind of gets extended because don't we have Star Wars, for example, which has some elements of, of Burroughs, right? We have Tatooine, right? So now we've got this... Martian, Mars-like planet, a desert planet, right? Uh, uh, you know, oh, by the way, uh, Tatooine, you know, we have Luke Skywalker and Ben Kenobi there. We meet the Tusken Raiders there. You know, there's the moisture farming, the moisture farm of Tatooine, uh, the Tusken Raiders, the Bantha here, all of these things that are taking place on Tatooine. And we find that, oh, even this too is a deriv derivation of Dune. Right, so you have Dune comes into play, right? And Dune, again, now are all these just analogs of Mars? This is kind of an odd thing. Like, what is that? Is it just the desert? And then when we think of the desert, our minds go toward Mars? Or, you know, so you start seeing this um, constellation of science fiction tradition of Mars and new names, right? So first we have it Mars... Then it becomes Barsoom in one kind of canon. And then it's Tatooine in the Star Wars canon. And then it's Dune in the Dune canon, right? So, and, and yet, there's kind of a way of looking at all of them and asking, oh, are these all some kind of Martian analog, right? And I want to kind of use that as the jump-off point for talking a bit about uh, Saturn here. So, um, and, and I'm going to do it through... I'm going to do it through Liz Green's astrology, and then I'm going to go, I'll go back to like Christian, uh, I mean, uh, William Lilly's Christian astrology and the Picatrix. I'm going to go into the cult of the Black Cube. I'm going to kind of end up with um, Rudolf Steiner, who's, who takes it even to another level, right? So maybe we'll start out um, just looking at Liz Green's take on Saturn. Uh, and she says here that... Uh, in traditional astrology, Saturn is known as a malefic planet. 
Even his virtues are rather dreary, self-control, tact, thrift, caution, and his vices are particularly unpleasant because they operate through the emotion we call fear. He has none of the glamour associated with the outer planets and none of the humanness of the personal planets. In popular conception, he is devoid of any sense of humor. I want to say that this is the Robert Hand introduction. No, this is Liz Green. Um, Robert Hand does do the introduction here, but this is... Uh, in traditional astrology, he is usually considered to be the bringer of limitation, frustration, hard work, self-denial, and even on his bright side, he's associated with wisdom, self-discipline. Uh, of the person who keeps his nose to the grindstone does not commit the atrocity of laughing at life. But his sign and house position, Saturn denotes those areas of life in which the individual is likely to feel thwarted in his self-expression. Uh, Saturn seems to correspond with painful circumstances, not to be concerned with any weakness or flaw on the part of the person himself, uh, and thereby earning the planet the title of the Lord of Karma. This rather depressive evaluation uh, attached to Saturn, despite a most ancient and persistent teaching which tells us he is the dweller at the threshold and the keeper of the keys to the gate, and that is through him alone that we may achieve eventual freedom through self-understanding. So here's the agency, right? This is like what the Lacanian drifting subject is sort of about, right? The idea is as we gain more agency, right? So John Carter goes to Mars. He gains this agency from the Martian point of view that is called Barsoom. But also we as film students start to see, oh, is Star Wars just a John Carter Mars ripoff of Dune? which also might be influenced by John Carter of Mars. So are they all Barsoom? Is it Mars? Right? So this kind of questioning of um, inquiry into agency the is a frustrating experience. And as Green goes on to say, the frustrating experiences that are connected with Saturn are obviously necessary when they are educational in a practical as well as a psychological sense. Whether we use psychological or esoteric terminology, the basic fact remains the same. Human beings do not earn free will except through self-discovery. And they do not attempt self-discovery until things become so painful that they have no other choice. Although few astrologers would consider Saturn a very cheerful bedfellow, the necessity of Saturnine experiences grudgingly, is grudgingly recognized. That there can be a kind of joy in this experience is not easily recognized. However, it is not enjoyment of pain which Saturn fosters, but rather the exhilaration of psychological freedom. This is not often recognized because many people have not experienced it. Okay, so we have a little bit of Liz Green's modern day take on Saturn. But let's kind of go into maybe a, another view of this where it's seen more like, how did they look at this in the 1600s, let's say. So in the 1600s, we'll see... Um, some talk here about uh, the positions of planet Saturn in the way that, you know, maybe a William Lilly might see this, right? And uh, I'm looking for the example. I had a footnote here. Let me grab that page. This is a little section that called about a man who's searching for the, the philosopher's stone. So this is like an astrology chart. An ingenious man with a serious propounded question whether he should obtain the philosopher's stone or that elixir by which such wonders are performed. Whether the knowledge of the querent is able or is he so cutting as to pr produce the feat of the art that he wants to achieve. The querent is signified in the ascendant and Mercury, Lord thereof, and thereof Mars, Lord of the Ninth, and aspects which may cast him from the other planets. Mars, it is in a square aspect to both Mercury and Saturn, and they and he in the fixed signs, they in terms of Saturn falling in the Ninth, I find Mercury lately retrograde. From hence I judge the querent has been formerly spent some time in the search of the admirable jewel, the elixir, but in vain and to no purpose. His application by the square about attaining the Philosopher's Stone by I have advised the Quirin to decline his further progress. His intellect part by the proximity of Saturn, both cohabitating in an earthly sign, for in any operation where Mercury is corrupted, 
There the fancy imaginative part is imbecile, where the lord of the work itself is unfortunate, as here Mars, lord of the ninth is. So the groundwork of matter itself is a principal part of operation is defective. And it says, foreseeing the lord of the ascendant and Saturn in Taurus, Saturn being the lord of the sixth health of evil influence naturally. See how it says Saturn is of evil influence, right? But it's not it's not evil influence. It's the thing that's blocking, right? But you can sort of see this is like 1647, right? So a little bit of a different view. They're flat out calling Saturn the evil planet. But where does this tradition kind of come from? You know, and I, what about the many names of Saturn, right? So this is where we kind of want to go to. Uh, we're going to... Saturnine Grimoire, and the scholarly materials on Saturn. This kind of takes us of a tour of Saturn in Islam, Saturn in a classical uh, cosmology, and Saturn in the Indian tradition, right? So if we go into Saturn in the Islamic text, it says that the medieval Islamic cosmology, like the Indian and Hermetic cosmologies, Consider the seven planets not as mere geological masses, but physical representatives of celestial intelligences or powers. Consequently, the serious student of celestial philosophy, read magic, can gain some hold over these beings and thereby, thereby improve his lot on earth. The medieval Islamic esoteric, the medieval Islamic esoteric uh, esoterica, the figure of Saturn is surprisingly popular. The Arabic word for the Saturnine de deity is Zuhal, which means the one who is far away, or the alien. While many familiar with Hermetic thought might like to claim this, that this concept of distance or being alien is borrowed from the Greek thought, it is definitely stated that Zuhal was the Arabic name for Saturn long before it became familiar with Greek learning. As Islam lacks any outright satanic current, the antimony we're speaking of the right-hand path would more likely admit the author would suggest that the cult of Zuhal took the role of, of Satanism in medieval Christianity. The Saturnine deity would become the champion of the desperate, the greedy, the rebel, and the vengeance-driven. So we sort of see this path of... of um, uh, uh, we see this path of Zuhal as a Saturnine path. And in some of these uh, uh, references, they say, go back to the compilers of the Picatrix and the Nabataean agriculture, somewhat awkwardly tried to turn the planet Saturn to some kind of angelic intelligence in the hopes of making its cult more palpable to the devout Muslim readers. But the Saturn is unique with the other outer planets, individual areas of authority, Saturn's authority over the planets themselves. And so the devotee of Saturn has the advantage of not being able to appeal to Zuhal's portfolio, discussed below, but possibly using Zuhal's influence to overrule the other planetary powers. And then we could, they, so they kind of go into this idea of the Nabataean arc, 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 agriculture, right, from the Picatrix. And I actually have a bit here. Okay, this bit here is from the Picatrix, and we're going to go right into that section. So here's Picatrix. Chapter 8 says, The way of prayer in which the Nabataeans used to pray to the sun and Saturn, and how they would speak to them and the spirits and draw forth their influences. The Nabataean sages have said that the power and works of the heavens and stars are from the sun originally. And this is because they see and understand that the moon helps him, that is, as much as it is in her power, while the sun does not need her efforts nor those of the other planets. And similarly, the five other planets follow the sun in their effect and obey and are humbled by him and proceed in their aforementioned affects according to the dispositions of the sun. In the same way, according to their op opinion, all their effects are primarily rooted in the sun and the other six planets help him by their effects. Similarly, the fixed stars and the sun's handmaidens, they serve and obey and are, humb and are humbled by him while they help him with his efforts this is not because of any need he has of them. These people were wont to make this prayer to the sun. So this prayer to the sun comes in and it says, 
Uh, we honor thee and praise thee, high Lord Son, for you give life to everything living in the world, and the whole universe is illuminated with your life and governed by your power. You are seated on high, the great kingdom full of light, perception, intellect, power, honor, goodness is yours. All things generate are generated by your powers. All things governed are governed by you. By you all plants live, and all things endure their strength through you. You are noble and honorable in your efforts, and powerful in your enduring heaven. We salute, we praise, and we honor you, and we pray in obedience and in humility, and reveal to our minds to you, and all things necessary to us we ask and require of you. You are our Lord, and we beseech you that we may perceive your life and governance by day as well as by night. We give you our wills, that you may free and defend those who turn to you from our enemies and from all evils. And that this also may be done by the moon, who is your handmaiden, and whose light and radiance are from you and the virtue that proceed from you. You are the giver of power and are the Lord of your chosen heaven. And the moon and the other planets serve you always and obey you and never depart from your precepts. May all this likewise always by us be praised unto the infinite age of ages. Amen. The sages of the Chaldean architecture have said that they praise to Saturn with the following prayer. But they first ascertained that the Lord's was not descending in the circle, nor occidental of the sun, nor the sun's rays, nor the midst of his retrogression. They found him to be free of all impediment, impediment, impediment and clean, however, and they made the following prayer to him, and uh, suffumulgated with old hides, fat, sweat, dead bats, mice, of which 14 bats were burnt and 14 mice were burned, and they took the ashes and spread them at the head of the image. And they proposed themselves around the image of stone or black sand, and working there were protected from Saturn's malice and evil, because from Saturn all evils, destructions, and sorrows proceeded. He is the Lord of poverty, misery, sorrow, imprisonments, sins, lamentations that were signified when he is cadent and unfortunate. But when he is in good disposition in his exaltation, he signifies purity, length of life, exaltation, joy, honor, wealth, inheritance, and the transmission of inheritances to sons and nephews. His goodness is when he is oriented to the sun, uh, when he is in the midheaven and the direct moon and swift in motion and elevated to the circle. So we see that when, when Saturn is in good favor, your transmission, you are able to have wealth. You're able to have this transmission to your sons and daughters. You know, this, this idea of, uh, of when you're aligned to it, it's actually a blessing, but when you are not aligned to it, this is where you get that malefic effect from the, from this day. So, uh, so this Chaldean architecture, this Nabataean ag agriculture, said this prayer to Saturn, and asked him the petitions for what he desired. The way that they made the Saturn prayer was as follows. So now we had the Sun prayer before. Now here is the Saturn prayer. We stand upright. We pray and we honor you in obedience and humility. We stand upright, facing this high living and enduring Lord, fixed in his power and dominion, who is Saturn. He is enduring in his heaven and potent in his lordships and adunit as the one. Ad unum is a technical term in medieval philosophy, the point being that Saturn's effects, attitudes, and magnificences are all one in the essence of nature. So the oneness in his effects, altitudes, and magnificences, he encircles all things and has power over all things visible and invisible. Now remember this visible and invisible. This is going to come back later. And has power over all that exists on the earth. By his power, all living things on earth live, and by his durability, they endure. They begin by his power and potency, and he makes them endure. And by his enduring permanence and his durability, the earth is made permanent. He makes waters and rivers to flow by his power. As they flow away, they are moved. By his life, he makes living things move so that they live. He is cold by nature. By his high rulership, trees grow and are raised up, and the earth is made ponderous according to the ponderousness of his motion. And if he wishes, he makes things other than they are. He is wise in the power of things, and the maker of perception, his knowledge extends to all things. For you are blessed. You are the Lord of the heavens, and your name is holy and revered and honored. We are obedient to you, and, and our feet we pray to you, and to your honor by your names. By your names, right? will, nobility, and honor beseech you that you will strengthen our senses and they will be enduring throughout our lives. And they will remain as they are and take pity on our bodies when they are separated from life so the worms and creeping things draw back from our flesh. You are the pious ancient Lord and none but you can restore what has been destroyed. 
You are permanent in your words and deeds, and you do not rep repent of your actions. You are slow and profound in your powers. You are so great, O Lord, that no one can take away what you have given, and what you prohibit, none can allow. You are the Lord of your elegant works and unique realm. You are the Lord of the other planets and other stars. Moving in their circles, fear the movement in your voice and shake with terror for fear of you. We ask you and we implore you that you will keep us safe from your fury and your wrath and deign to remove from us your evil effects and in your purity have pity on us and let your good and noble names touch your pity so that we may again be able to remove by your power all evil effects and have pity on us by virtue of your will, by all your names and by your high noble name to which you will allow more than all your other names. This name, we pray that to you and ask that you pour your pity upon us. So the, clearly the highest name of Saturn was originally written here, but was omitted here. They omitted the name. Interesting, right? So there was another name for this, right? A missing name. So we got a mystery here. So there's a missing name from the Picatrix, right? But now you see that this tradition gets sort of um, uh, even... Washia writes of Zuhal, Beware the evil of this god when he is angered or out of the west of the sun or veiled in the rays of the middle of its return. Pray to him this prayer which we have just given him. We are giving this prayer, given a burnt offering to his idol. Burn for him 14 dead bats and an equal amount of rats. Prostrate yourself to him, a black stone on black sand, and seek refuge from him against his evil. He is the lord of evil and sin and filth and dirt and poverty. So you can see how it's sort of turning from this idea of a, 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 a hidden turner of karmic time to something that's just more like the evil side of it, right? Uh, the, the text of the Picatrix, oh yeah, this is going to repeat some of that Picatrix text here. So you see, this is kind of comes out of that Picatrix um, Nabataean reading. It says, having discussed the aspects we are about to appear, it is good to review those that occur on their own. Saturn is said to be cold, and this follows the Islamic cosmology, which holds that planets are living and being hot or cold by nature. Saturn is cold by nature, which is because he is elderly, but because he's a chthonic figure. So he's below the ground. He's the grinding of the glacier, right? He's the, this is the kind of feeling. We may not consider the Picatrix, which has a great deal to say about the character and resonances of Zuhal. While it is more in general to say about Zuhal than Nabataean architecture, it was compiled later and used the agriculture as one of its sources. So we, we know about this, the black stones, uh, his power is cold, he's power over old things, brooding, too much talking, the knowledge of secrets, the mysterious side of things, and if Saturn is retrograde, it holds the signs of disgrace and weakness. Right, so here we can see this Picatrix condition, uh, uh, this Picatrix tradition, sorry. Um, so then... From Picatrix, we can kind of go into the classical view. So we have this Picatrix kind of tradition of, of it that kind of links into this Islamic black stone. Uh, and it's interesting here, it says, As noted previously, the description of the Saturnine deity as a black stone or a six-sided idol could be interpreted as a direct reference to the black stone, uh, which is the symbolic heart at Mecca. For those familiar with the legend, it is said to be the black stone fell from the heavens at the time of Adam and Eve and has served as a sacred marker since the dawn of humanity. The legend of black iron falling from the sky and becoming worshipped by ancient pagans suggests the originality of an idol with no connection to Abrahamic deity. This point will be discussed further below in the second section, Saturnine Gnosis. So we'll kind of go into Saturnine Gnosis after this. But we're starting out here, we've got some interesting features just from the um, Picatrix. And, you know, even Picatrix is talking about its true name, right? So what is the true name? So is it Zuhal? Is it Saturn? Well, let's look at other names of Saturn. In the Greek tradition, um, the classical tradition, we call it Kronos, right? Kronos really gives us the name of time, right? So, so the Roman name of Saturn... Uh, comes out of the you know, Etruscan, probably. And Saturn, uh, is. there's a dispute over this etymology for the name of Saturn, but the best explanation to date is that the Latin adap adaptation of the Etruscan underworld god Sater. The Sater was a malevolent Chthonic figure, 
identified with the northern direction. And chronos, on the other hand, clearly stems from the Greek kier, to cut, which is connected with kar, action, in Sanskrit, which yields karma, right? So the cutting, this is where we have our Saturn with his, his um, scythe, right? The cutting aspect of Saturn, right? So we start seeing this tradition comes up. Um, Saturn, according to the Greek tradition, uh, of course, the rise of Saturn's nature harvesting was understood to be broader than just agriculture. Saturn was the harvester of all things, even the gods, as his mythology makes plain. Saturn is not a creator deity. His role is more related to entropy within the cosmic framework. Saturn, Kronos, is identified with time. This may be due to Kronos' name being similar to Kronos, time. In Greek, time is itself a reaper, a force that ends the lives of all living beings and human enterprises. The mythology of the Greeks and Romans show that empires of the gods are vulnerable to time and change, and this negative aspect of time is embodied by the Saturnine deity. Saturn, according to the Greek and Roman culture, was partnered with a female consort, usually said to be his sister, um, the mother desolation, and is often embodied by female figures such as the Irish Morrigan or the Indian Kalima, right? So we have this sort of tradition here. Uh, it's also the relation of Kronos back to the... Um, Kronos goes back to the primordial chaos, right? So this is like the theogony place. Saturn was rehabilitated by the Roman state and his spouse became identified as Ops, the Roman goddess of plenty. But in Greeks, on the other hand, always identified Kronos with his sister Rhea, the daughter of Gaia. So we have the connection between Gaia and Kronos, right? Saturn himself is disposed by his own children. And we have the classic Saturn consuming his children. There's a Roman Saturnalia, which comes in December. Saturnalia was wild, debauched, and orgiastic. At times during this period, all norms and taboos were overturned. Celebrants gathered and would cry, Eo Saturnalia, which served to remind each other that they were celebrating a religious occasion. A Saturnine prince, the princeps Saturnicalis, was appointed in a place of the usual king or emperor to serve as the master of ceremonies, and his dictates were generally followed. So we had this sort of like the party led by the Saturnalia. Uh, in our contemporary spiritual cynicism, we might think, yes, well, no doubt things don't get too carried away. What slave would abuse his owners and social norms go back to normal on December 24th, right? So this Saturn's day was sort of like this day, suspiciously close to Sat December 25th, becoming a prominent Christian holiday that involves the exchange of presents, right? So we have the Saturn in this classical tradition, again, also appearing with the sickle, uh, the idea of um, Saturn being part of the uh, culling. And also we have Saturn as among the stars. You see Saturn on, his, on a chariot here, uh, pulled by dragons or serpents, which is quite interesting. And then finally, the tour of this uh, uh, inside of the Saturnine Grimoire leads us to Saturn in the Indian tradition, where we see Lord Sani, so we see the Saturnine cult across Islam. We see it across the Greco-Roman world. We see it in the Indian tradition. Lord Sani, the master of planets, Sani, also called Shanishwar, has been established temples and devoted practices that go back thousands of years. Unlike the study of the Islam Islamic Zuhal or the classical Saturnus, the study of the cult of Lord Sani is not limited to old texts and archaeology, does not rely on reconstructions, clever theories, or linguistic wrangling. One of the great joys in studying the figure of the Saturnine deity in India is that one gets to examine a living tradition, visit thriving temples. So there still is a Saturn tradition to this date. You know, there's mantras to Saturn. And those who follow the Indian um, Vedic astrology are aware of um, uh, the role of Saturn among the planets. Um, we have Sani is also the subject of a more recent study, such as Liz Green's Saturn, A New Look at the Old Devil, which is what we have on the table. 
where we start to see he is of a very dark nature in Hinduism. I think the Saturn Asani has a black crow as one of his um, effects, right? Being the planets and rulers of days, Sani are transcendent sources of evil, but more importantly, this is the region that prizes devotion above all other avenues to salvation. Demons, even if worshipped, praised, and adored, are still unpredictable. Gods and goddesses, on the other hand, are often amenable to devotional contracts and thrive on human advances from which demons shrink. Sani is malevolent, cruel, harsh, but fair. He is the same for everyone is as much of use phrase in Telugu, the dark planet as well as others, is endowed with a personality, physique, and biography, and the status of Devata allows him to be approached, albeit cautiously worshipped, and in a few cases even elevated to a personal deity. So uh, Saturn in the Indian tradition, the Sani Maha Mantra, like it's Om Sham, no, it's a uh, Om Shant the Sani Amaha Matra is uh, Om Sham Sani Sanaya Namaha, something like that. It's like the uh, Sani Mantra that uh, worshippers of Sani do. Sani's titles say much about his role in the religion. As noted pre previously, some of Sani's names, so this is Sani uh, Saturn, as the endless, the end cause, the all devourer, the steady, the controller. In Vedic astrology, Saturn serves as the great malefic, the bringer of ill fortune. It is his gaze that is feared. And when he was born, his gaze fell upon his father, causing an eclipse. Um, Sani is thus the bringer of chaos. Suffering and trauma on a cosmic level. His black gaze can be so piercing to affect a single person, but it also an entire region can suffer if he wishes it. So you can see that this uh, Saturn tradition crosses different um, roles. So you can see some of these practices of Sani. Here's, a, here's a, uh, an image of Saturn as Sani, and there's his black bird. Uh, and it says, as an example, a popular yantra vending site advertised the power of Lord Sani yantra saying, when it is creating positive impact by being positioned in a benefic state, this yantra simulates to get further favorable. And when it's created neg negative impact by being positioned in a malefic state, this yantra neutralizes it and eliminates it. So the idea is to neutralize negative and to encourage the positive is sort of a form of this sani worship, right? Which is sort of like the approach to karma, right? The idea of minimizing and directing, right? And then some of the bhakti, some of the practices they have for Sani here is giving charity on Sunday, caring for ugly or ill-favored trees on Saturday, reciting the Sani story on Saturdays, reciting Sani's mantra, Om Sham Shadi Sadischaya Nama, especially on Saturday, wearing an iron nail, wearing a ring or pendant with a sapphire, and obviously the day of Saturday. Okay, so that's taken us a little bit through some of that Saturn uh, tradition, the historical side of it. But what about the path of Saturn, right? What about the Saturnine, the concept of the Saturnine Gnosis, right? So this is where it's kind of gets interesting here. Uh, so if we look at the Saturnine Gnosis, without the names, we've crossed all these names. And when the conceit we began with was talking a bit about what is the name below these names, right? Is there a name below the names, right? And we here have here, the most complex question that this study addresses is this, who or what is the Saturnine deity? The first section explored three cults of the planet, classical, Islamic, and Indian. But the traditions go back even beyond that. For example, Babylonian and Egyptians have an awareness of the dark star. Other cultures such as Celt Celts and Germans have their own analogs like Baylor and Ymir, or Ymir. The dark grandfather of the gods and morals as a character appears in most Indo-European mythologies. Baylor, the Saturnine figure in old Irish tradition. Um, Wodan, the Germanic Wodan. Wotan is the ruler of the dead and is well established, but the god of the aesthetic. He has also a close relationship with the living. His bipolar nature encompasses both the world and the dead. 
and the realm of the living. The devotees are pulled toward him in moments of ecstatic rapture and transport. This magical magnetism was called Eros of the Distance by the philosopher Ludwig Klagis. And the Fraternitas Borealis, Wotan is addressed as the innermost and outermost, chained in magical sleep. He is the god in the mountain to which he draws the visionary dreamers. Of course, Saturn is not merely an Indo-European figure or an Indo-Semitic figure. The Saturnine deity appears in the Aztecs with uh, Tezcatlipoca, the Black Sun, um, and like Sani and Saturn, for a time was considered a major god of the Aztec Empire. There's also the voodoo deity Baron Samadhi. So in that, in the voodoo um, pantheon, he embodies the powers of death and fertility. He has a chaotic and irascible character with lewd gallows humor. The Baron dresses in black and Saturday is secret to him. Liminal places like crossroads and graveyards are his territory. He is a popular deity with those in need of magical assistance. Baron Samadhi, right? So we start seeing this across all of it. And of course, the Saturnine deity does not merely maintain an ancient mythology, but is also in the consciousness of more modern thinkers. The great British author J.R.R. Tolkien created two primary villains for the Middle Earth, Morgoth and Sauron. While these figures appear imaginary, Tolkien was noted historian and linguist. Morgoth is the black tyrant, the general who seeks to enslave all of Earth and her humankind. He claims to be the master of the fates of Arda. Garbed in all black, he fights a war against the Valar gods for control of the cosmos. His weapon is not a sword or a spear, but a hammer named Grand, the grinder. In the war, he is injured in his leg. And he continues uh, going into the Sauron side. Sauron was his lieutenant. He had the burning eye. And the Saturn idea is, is, is a powerful and menacing figure they talk about. This. So, so what, are some of the, what are some of these features now? We, we, we could talk about some of the features common across all of the Saturn ideas. Where well, they talk about darkness, so the color black, it's associated with the color black, the chthonic, uh, associated with trauma as a potential source of energy or working through a pain, something like this. Um, the idea of chains, we often see Saturn with chains or in chains. Zuhal is lame. Um, uh, in the Aztec tradition, there's a black mirror, there's a serpent, there's some kind of chain to, um, the chain itself becomes a magical com component. Maybe even iron comes up. Time is a consideration of the Saturnine deity, the idea of chronos, the idea of temporality, aging, uh, the karmic wheel, right? We get it associated with cold more than warmth, disruption, and the primordial chaos. And also this ancestor worship, you know, Father Dagon in the Lovecraftian realm, right? Father Dagon and this inhuman thing that's in the past, right? This sort, And also just the nature of the way ancestry becomes monstrous in, in a kind of, kind of way. And then there's the, the uh, idea of the black cube that comes out, the Leviathan. Um, uh, the black cube symbol itself has a Saturnine component to it, a Saturn component. And obviously, finally, there's death and the culling of death. Um, and like deities like Orcus, time waits for no man. He's, he, he, he reaps life um, in this way. So in summary, all of these characteristics kind of come together. They paint a very interesting view of Saturn in these traditions. But there's another tradition I kind of want to call out briefly here. And that is just this Rudolf Steiner tradition. Right, and this is very interesting because Steiner has a view of these planets like nowhere else. Now, this is written. This was from um, the occult movement in the 19th century. This was written in 1915, October 25th. He goes, the veil of phenomena in nature on one side with the objective reality behind. He's talking about visible and invisible life. Our soul and our life, what is living, what is dead. We know the consciousness differs from man's earlier consciousness with his heritage of ancient clairvoyance. But we know that this inherited clairvoyance faded away and that our present consciousness, while functioning normally on a physical plane, is as described above. The question may be asked, why is it that our consciousness today is constituted as it is? The reason is that during the present cycle of evolution, as well as everything else that has been described, we have to develop the true relationship that should prevail between one human and another. Our present form of consciousness, therefore, has a very definite task. 
During the earlier periods of old Saturn, old Sun, and old Moon, we lived in different states of consciousness. Now, when he says old Saturn, old Sun, and old Moon, I want us to think a little bit like our interest, our intro, introductory um, conceit here. Of, you know, it's is it is it Barsoom? Is it Dune? Is it Tatooine? You know, is it Saturn? In the Sani Indian tradition, is it Zuhal? Is it Kronos? What is what you know? What what are we talking about here, right? But he calls it old Saturn, and like we were talking in Saturn Gnosis, what was the Saturn before the names, right? We are gradually preparing for this different form of consciousness in our present cycle of evolution. We have to develop in ourselves, through the way we relate ourselves to the world, the form of consciousness belonging to this cycle. And besides all that, must be developed in connection with the mortal life. There can also be the fact that through this form of consciousness, there can unfold the right relationship of one human soul to another, a relationship we had not acquired before the beginning of the earth period, and without which, if we do not acquire it during the earth period, we shall not be able to maintain our existence during the periods of Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. In the periods of old Saturn, old Sun, and old Moon, preceding the Earth period, man had not, in this sense, acquired the right relationship to other men. When he says men, he means people. In a certain sense, he was too close to them. During the old Moon period, conditions were still such that the will of one had a direct effect on the other. Moreover, this process are regulated and guided by the spirits of the higher hierarchies. So anyway, we get this kind of notion of an old Saturn. What, what is he talking about? He's got a whole other language that doesn't seem to correspond with any of these other traditions that we've talked about. Right? This is from the occult movement in the 19th century. Well, let's see. What, what he, does he have more to say about it? Let's see. In, um, in Knowledge of Higher Worlds, How It Is Achieved, he talks about enlightenment here. Uh, enlightenment is the result of a very simple process, of very simple processes. Here, too, there's a matter of developing certain feelings and thoughts which slumber in every human being and must be wakened. Only one who with infinite patience carries through the simple processes strictly with the perseverance can be led to the perception of the manifestation of the inner light. Now, this is very interesting because when we talk about the inner light. I want we, we talked about it in the Saturn context. This is very important. Steiner has a concept where he says the light that we see is the three-dimensional light. And the light that we don't see is the light of introspection. It, it's a dark light. And it is a fourth-dimensional light. Because it's not being seen with the eyes looking outward. It's being seen with the eyes looking inward. So here we have a, a, a correlation with the Saturn of, as the dark. Right? And the karma of wrestling with one's conscience. Right, So the beginning is made by studying different beings of nature in particular. A transparent beauty formed stone, a crystal, a plant, an animal. One should endeavor at first to direct one's whole attention to the comparison of the stone with the animal. And thoughts here indicated as examples must pass through the soul accompanied by alert feelings. The pupil says to himself, the stone has a form, the animal too has a form. The stone remains motionless. The animal changes its place. So he's starting to say, how do we start to develop the organs of clairvoyance? And he ends with this idea, or we'll end with this idea. He says, the organs thus formed are eyes of the spirit. With them, the pupil gradually learns to see something like psychic and spiritual colors. The spiritual world with its lines and figures remains dark as long as he achieved only what is described as preparation. Through enlightenment, it becomes light. Here, too, it must be noted that the words dark and light, as well as other expressions, used described only approximately what is meant. Nothing is possible if ordinary language... Nothing is more possible if ordinary language is used, for this language was created by physical conditions only. When a stone is clairvoyantly observed, a color streams from it, from which occult science describes as blue or bluish-red, and the emanation around an animal is described as red or reddish yellow. In reality, the colors seen are of a spiritual kind. Uh, one person who has acquired the faculty of seeing with spiritual eyes, as he encounters sooner or later, uh, the beings mentioned, some of them higher than man in rank, some of them lower, 
are beings who never enter physical existence. And if a person has reached the point described here, the way to a great deal are open to him. But nobody should be advised to proceed still further without paying careful heed to what is said or otherwise communicated by the spiritual investigator. And with regard also to what is already being described, it is also best to pay attention to such experienced guidance. Moreover, if someone has the strength and endurance to reach the point denoting the elementary stages of enlightenment, he will quite certainly seek and find the right guidance. So I think that's probably a good good place to end it. Oh uh, yeah, so hopefully that was interesting to everyone. The uh, the names of um, the names of some of the of Saturn, that confusion of names, how it really leads us to the idea of understanding what the core Saturn is beneath the names, right? It's beyond the, the, the cults, it's beyond the traditions, it's below those traditions. And then we start seeing, oh, maybe it's just a human functioning, right? And I think, um, you know, when we talk about the influence of this, you know, when Jungian alchemy, we talk about uh, Steiner's anthroposophy, uh, I think a lot of these, you get a lot of this symbolism. One of the things that I, that I always liked about the Dune Saga was how this in, in projecting the fictional Dune universe in the future, I always kind of had this wondering, is Dune actually like an Atlantean dream or something about our deep past that we don't understand? And some of those themes get explored in, in, uh, in Alchemy and Anthroposophy and the Dune Saga. Go check out our bookstore links below. Um, thank you guys for joining the podcast again. If you made it this far, uh, uh, your, your subscriptions and likes and comments are read and well appreciated. You can go check out our Patreon if you'd like to support us. And we will see you next week. Hopefully we have a great topic for you then. Um, go check out our other Saturn videos. If you're interested in Saturn, we've got uh, four or five podcasts on Saturn. And we've actually um, have got a Saturn um, podcast lecture series. If you go check out our bookstore, you can see some of the books, uh, the podcast lecture series that are available out there too. So thank you guys for watching and we'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye.